Um, well, firstly, good evening, everyone, for those that are having an evening, and good morning for those who That's are having wine, their, by the way. their morning. <laughs> Um, my name's Karen Kiriaku. For those of you I have yet had, uh, haven't yet had the pleasure to meet, I'm the host of Stringwag, and I warmly welcome you to our very, um, very special second session uh, with also my very special guest Stephen Chin, who I will introduce formally in just a little moment. Uh, before we start the proceedings officially, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where we are all meeting. Um, today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, extending those respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are here today and acknowledge the important role that music has played in our culture on these lands over tens of thousands of years. So welcome to our second string wag. This was um, an idea that I had many moons ago, but then COVID happened and the last thing I felt like doing was putting another hour of my life on Zoom. Yes, but, we all like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel really differently about it now and um, I think we can all see, you know, now that we're a bit more balanced, how Zoom is just such a great uh, a, a great connector of people for us all. So um, I'm hoping this uh, this series continues and that the sessions evolve and I welcome any of your feedback on the sessions as well. So. Um, in my very many years of working with Oster and string players and arts organisations where I currently work, I'm just aware of how much knowledge is out there in our community and how sharing this knowledge is really what makes us better teachers and in turn of course that makes us have um, better students and that in turn goes on to influence the cultural landscape of our country. So it's pretty pretty important to not forget how important and special the work is that we do. Um, especially on those days we might want to throw in the towel, you know, it's really, it's really good to um, have a little extra dose of inspiration and I'm hoping that these sessions sort of help in that way. So I feel enormously lucky that last time we had Loretta Finn sharing all of her gorgeous top tips for beginners and looking back at that video we talked really fast so um, I don't know maybe it was the first person I spoke to that day so you just have to keep up if you go back to watch that video Today, we welcome a man who probably needs no introduction, but you're getting one anyway. And it's my absolute pleasure to be chatting with Stephen Chin tonight, which makes our chin wag more a chin wag. A chin wag. <laughs> yeah. If you will. His topic tonight is intonation, tone, and musical talent developing pathways to take students from intermediate to diploma level. Now I just want to read some of your bio Stephen because you're a very impressive person um, and you've worked with some amazing people and doing amazing things. So Stephen's undergraduate training in both violin and composition were completed at Sydney University under John Harding and renowned Australian composer Peter Sculthorpe respectively. He holds a Master of Music degree specialising in performance and pedagogy from Queensland Conservatorium of Music, Griffith University, where he also lectured. Stephen's been invited to perform with such groups as the ABC Sinfonia, the uh, Badineri Players, Queensland Philharmonic Orchestra, Queensland Symphony Orchestra, Queensland Pops Orchestra and Corda Spiritus. hope I said that right. That's right, yep. He's also an active member of a number of chamber ensembles. Stephen publishes a number of string works. That's humble, isn't it? Stephen publishes a number of string works. <laughs> Stephen publishes an enormous amount of string works, which have been used as competition pieces for the Australian Music Examination Board. And um, he's been invited numerous times to adjudicate at various Steadfords and is demand, in demand as a string and orchestral clinician. In 2022, Stephen was awarded the National Award by the Australian Strings Association in recognition for an outstanding contribution to the string community throughout Australia. And this award is given only once every three years. He's a past president of OSTA and presently organises the International Professional Development Tours for Teachers of OSTA and is currently principal string teacher and director of orchestra at Brisbane Grammar School. So welcome, Stephen. Thank you. Thank Can you I just ask one question and then yeah. I'm not going to interrupt you. It's a little bit too much, isn't it? <laughs> it's so much. You've done so, and that doesn't even skim the surface, really. Can you quickly just tell us how the tour is looking? Um, it's, I've got one person on the waiting list. It's totally sold out. Amazing. Um, so we meet in Lisbon on the 14th of September for two days of rehearsals, then we move on to um, 
Salamanca, then Madrid, then San Sebastian, and then Barcelona. 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 So it's really, it's looking good. Um, we've got a, a, a really nicely balanced orchestra. Um, I think the teachers are just so excited that this is just for them, you know. It's like having your first love, you know. <laughs> and this is the third one we've done. And just to see teachers um, ignited yeah. uh, after giving out so much is truly wonderful to see, you know. It's, it's their whole life's work being put towards being string players and it's just great to then just take the time just to be a string player. Well, that's right. And and it's, look, the, on the bottom line, I mean, not the bottom line, but at, at a really good point is that it's um it's a tax deduction. It's it's completely, you know, viable um, PD um, for teachers. So it, it's great. So that's why we sold out because it's exciting, it's fun, and there's so much to learn by just playing. And we've got Rob McWilliams, who's a wonderful conductor, who's, um, whose arm I twisted. And I said, come on, Rob, you can come along. So, you know, we, originally, Yvonne, we were going to go to Finland. <laughs> so we were going to go up there. Yes, we're going to go through Estonia and Finland and finish in St. Petersburg. When? When? Oh, when? that was this year. So it's all changed. Plans have it's changed. It's all changed, you know. But yeah. might try to. I, I do want to get to Estonia and Finland too. So I've got a good friend of mine who's in in, in Estonia. So that that would be really really good. So it's, you know, he regularly emails me from Talent. Says, "Where are you?" So that'd be good. But look, that's one of the 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 the, um, the one thing that I think is really good. Um, working backwards from that is that I've I found a lot of joy. You know, um, that's why I get up at 4.30 in the morning, Karen, is that I go get up early at 4.30, I make sure that I'm in school by 5.45, and that's when I do my practice. And I think it's just really important to, to even if you're a really busy teacher, to find your time to practice, you know, and, and even if it's just a little bit, even if it's of a, you know, a, a a couple of double stop scales or a Paganini Caprice that last two minutes or, you know, a Vivaldi concerto or anything, you know, a Kreutzer study, love, love the Kreutzer studies. Yeah. So even if you do that, just keeps you honest as a, as a, as a, as a player. My um, new substitute for not having time to practice if I feel like I haven't got time to play or I'm just too tired to do it something effectively is to go to a really good concert. And I feel like that, that's the other option is just be immersed by amazing music. Oh, immersed and see, yeah, particularly chamber music concerts because it's so visceral and you can just see so much there. Yeah. But I, I'm finding that, and, and I have, like in my, um, I'll just show you, I'm at home here, and in my little, I have this little daily notebook that I keep just for me. This is just for me, just little, little tiny notes and stuff like that <laughs> that I'll just, I'll just write in about what I think, you know, about what I need to do and what I think is a good idea. I mean, in a year's time, I might just think, oh, I've moved on from that. But it's, I like to be always thinking. I like to be coming up with new ideas. I think if I feel as if I'm in reasonable shape as a, as a player myself, I can demonstrate that. At the moment, I've got like, I've got about like five or six LMUS students and about oh, a dozen AMUS A students. And then I've got my whole run of beginners students as well. Yeah. Well, really let's just nice. let's talk about that because most, um, well, a lot. I think the bulk of the PD that we do, particularly with Oster, perhaps, would be about the beginner student and about good setup and um, ensemble skills and basic conducting skills, all that really solid groundwork which we have to have down pat. But we don't probably spend enough time talking about that high end level and how to get those students from intermediate to advanced and this is totally your specialty and what a great opportunity for us to learn from the very best well i um i used to be quite um not fearful but i used to take everything quite slowly you know at and you do have to go slow but don't get me wrong but i was um I sort of dragged my feet going from say about fifth grade to about eighth grade. You know, it was 
it wasn't it wasn't as fast as I would have liked to have been. Now I have no problems. You know, I'll, I'll have I'll have um, I've got these twins at the moment and they're really pumping hard. So they'll they've just done their fifth grade exams. They've got the high distinctions and that was really good. And they're they're just about to do sixth grade. We'll do that in um, August. And then we'll move on to seventh grade and do eighth grade by this time next year. Wow. Why don't you why don't you start us at the start then of where, you know, how your teaching has evolved to okay. specialise in this and you just take it away and, and if I need to interrupt you, I just will, but I don't think okay. it will be too well, fascinating. Number one is that you've got to look, I, I just, I think that they all can do it. You've just got to think how they look. They might turn up twisted like that, but in my mind, I just have them, I almost close my eyes and I see them, I see beautiful, fluent, beautiful posture, relaxed shoulders, really good breathing. I just see all that sort of stuff. And I think, well, we just got to, I use that as my template for them and they've got to fit into that, you know? So I, I, I do nag a lot, you know, but it's nice nagging, you know, it's like, well, how about that pinky in the right place? You know, how about all this sort of stuff? But the, the number one priority is that, that I take who I have you know, I don't believe in um, in vetting students and sort of having a screen. I just take everybody. You know, um, it makes for me personally. It I feel that it makes me a better teacher. If I, I I mean I've got some some real doozies at the moment. You know, that have got behavioural problems. I've got ones that just have no sense of rhythm at all, and and that's really interesting for me. And um, then I've got some very talented ones that don't know how to practice properly and don't want to know how to practice properly. So that's that's always a challenge. And then I've got the nice few that practice properly and that are reasonably talented. You know? Okay, so it's good to know you have like the real the real, real deal, deal of what it's, it's like. Oh, oh, wow, yeah. So I would have liked to have seen like there was one little girl today and. She's got a great ear. She could sing everything beautifully in tune. Can't play in time. Can't read properly. Just, just a, when she came to me, it it was all wrong. It was just like, so we're just having to. But you don't want to kill the joy. So we have a lot of fun, and we're just having. She's having to sing a lot, and it's paying off. But it's it's really slow. That's really slow. And then I've got other people that want to move from. Kreutzer studies to the, you know, the Brahms violin concerto in three minutes, you know, and so I have to hold them back, you know, so it's all this, but, um, but I, I think just working with, with students and just seeing what their pop, their, their setup is, that's why I go to conferences and, and see wonderful people like Yvonne talking about stuff that's really wonderful. Um, and I pick up all sorts of things um, from them. Um, one of the big things, I'll just show you what I use. I might have brought this here. Um, this is this is a sheet that I use. This is like my Bible. Okay. So it's all all just different perfect intervals. So what that does, this, that's like my cornerstone, is that I, I find that once they can play like a double stop and a perfect interval really in tune and they're listening to different tones, or if they're in the case of unisons and octaves that eliminated any other tones, then you can look at, they, they, they're listening to something that's just beautiful all the time. Then you can make all these like adjustments about height and all that sort of physical stuff that really does need to happen at a very refined level. But if they keep on coming back to the intonation sheet, I've taught people that have no sense of pitch and they're, they're pretty spot on with their pitch. And it's a joy to see because then once their pitch is sort of certain and they've got a way of being able to make it more certain, then, um, or more accurate, I should say, then um, they just get addicted to the sound. There's a confidence with 
there's a confidence. It's a good sound, isn't there? Well, you wake up every day and you know you're going to make a beautiful sound. You're just going to just want to play more. Like, it can't get more simple than that. You know, you, and I just say, look, I enjoy. You, you don't have to play this like it's torture. Just what about you enjoy it? Well, when we get this, let's find that difference tone of the first finger on the A string with the open E and just let's celebrate that. And then you just say, okay, lift this up a little bit, have a pinky in the right place, all this sort of stuff. They'll get because they know that it's going to make a nicer sound. It's really simple. Then I have that and then I'll have... Um, I, I reserve my flesh the, um, for, you know, for the really advanced students. I used to go straight on into it, but I, I found that um, I do this a lot. This is, this is one, this is actually um, an idea that I got from Markov. Have you, have you heard of Markov at all? Hi. A Russian violinist called Markov. Have you heard of Markov? Anybody? Yeah. Oh, Francis nodding her head. She has. Yeah. But you've, we've seen this one in the Amy B, which everybody hates. This is um, keys in one position scales. There's the Galamian one, which we see all the time, which has a little like a turnaround. But the Markov one, actually, I find is way better because if you look at this here, oh, sorry. Can you see that? If you look at that, all the patterns like on the G string and on the D string are just sort of replicated on the way down. So they're reinforced. So all you got to do is repeat that top note. So I, I spoke to actually I have a I have a a, um, a four hundred page scale book that's about to be released was going to be about to be released five years ago, and um, I've trimmed it down to one hundred eighty pages. So it's it's going to be released very soon, and it has one of those. But I did speak to Robin about it, and Robin reckons that 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 exercise is probably the one of the most important exercises that violinists do. Really good. Just your back. Just if you're just learning a Mozart concerto, for instance, and you just want to know all your notes in G major, you just give them that. Or you're doing A minor. It's just it's so simple. So they would have like all. I've got all these. I just I've generated these and I'll put these in my new book. I have these in all the keys. And there's the things that you can play around with. You can say, okay, let's go into third position. All right, can just play all those notes up and down in in C major. And they go, oh yeah, that's all right. And then you say, okay, let's do it in D flat, starting on C. Oh, okay, starting on a leading note. So, and it really makes it sharpens their ear up. I, I, I'm finding that my my kids get a really good sense of the fingerboard. They're confident with their fingerboard, and they get a really good sense of what tonic actually is. So that's number one. Once we do that, then I in conjunction with all of that. I mean, this is my nitty gritty stuff. This is how I get them on from, then we go into these. Or well, your three octave system. Now there's nothing fancy. This is just flesh or sev check actually. So it is basically sev check, but it's a three octave major harmonic, a melodic minor, harmonic minor, the, the, the seven arpeggios, including dominant, then the, then you've got all the, the broken thirds and the chromatic. Nothing fancy there, but I have to say this layout, they like the layout. I find the layout for the, that I've seen before is atrocious. And it's so, it's just so much nicer to have something that's laid out properly that kids can actually read. So the visuals or the optics are, are, are quite important for that. Massively it's, important. They're massively important. We don't want big black scary notes all compressed together and too much information on a page. We want to feel fresh and... And you can free, you're free to write your own stuff on that. So that's all that. Now then, it, it, still in conjunction with that, and this is like I've got a bunch of year four students. They're about nine years old and they're doing all this stuff at the moment, you know, and they're loving it. I had one girl that so was almost in tears the other day because she didn't get another double stop scale. What? <laughs> so then, then we do this. So these, these are, now this is the most neglected scale in the world. Fourths, fifths. Why don't we do those? 
you know, because they're not written out, well, write them out, you know, or get them. I mean, after they've done this, they've memorised it too. Six, fingered octaves, incredibly important for your strengthening of your hand. Tense. Why can't they do tense pro earlier enough, you know? So I have a whole book of, of those in all major and minor keys. So that's, that's as soon as they hit around about, um, just about fifth grade, actually, I start giving them all that stuff. So with the double stop scales, I, um, I would just emphasize this sort of, um, the elasticity of the hand and the fact that the, um, that only one finger could be put down at a time. How do you approach the, um, the tension the, when students like over press because it's double stops, therefore it's scary, therefore we have to press 40 times harder. Is that something that pops up a lot in your teaching, that tension? Yeah, well, what, what I do, what I find the biggest problem with teaching, what, what I've noticed, is that they, that they move into actual playing the notes together too soon. So I find that actually keeping them separate for a long time, keeping them broken for a longer period of time is better. So for instance, with thirds, the, the, the bottom notes are, are leading. So you just hold that D and you say, okay, how do you feel about that D? I wonder if you can play, say I'm doing D major and thirds. How, how do you find that D to the fourth finger? Can, is there any way that you can just let that pressure go? A little bit more and still come back a clear sound. Ah, oh, that's better. That looks good. Now, how about you reach for the F sharp now? And let's join it together. How does that feel? Let's play that five times. So they do that. Now, and you can see by their body how they're moving. You think, okay, that sounds good. Do you feel good? All right, let's move on to the next one. But in making sure that it's one at a time, incredibly slowly, is really important. And number one, number one thing is. Do you feel good about it? Is this beautiful for you? You know, that's for me, I just think, do you feel good about this? I say, yeah, I don't know. I've got a bit of tension in Charlotte. I say, well, look, let's just put the violin down and just let's just all move around. Let's do a dance. So I put some dancing on or something like that, or let's do a bit of Tai Chi or something like that, you know? So we do, we do, we might go off and do something like that. Or we might get them, if I want to do some sound, Oh, nice. Overtones on a Tibetan bowl. Is that what you've got? Darling, I do this all the time. I don't know if this is going to be picked up by Zoom. Yep. So you and I have been doing this forever, but to see a little kid just get the Tibetan bowl and, and generate this incredible sound, and I say, well, look, you have to work hard to make that sound. Well, you've got to work hard to make the sound right. And you can't be tense. You've got to be relaxed. You've got to work with it, you know. And, and then we hand them a violin. Well, it's a different thing. It feels, it feels better for them. So I think little things like that really help. So if you haven't got, even like getting a Coke bottle and getting to blow into a bottle and make a beautiful sound there, they'll understand that making a good sound requires control and 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 it can be beautiful if you approach it the right way so that's that's uh, that's a really important thing so coming back to the double stops does it feel good does it sound really good you know how is the bow positioned on there but i, I find that this this leading with the with the correct finger is good so i have this little i don't know whether people agree with me but i um for for thirds thirds um uh thirds fifths and normal octaves, we lead from the bottom note, and for fourths, sixths, fingered octaves and tenths lead from the top note. Okay. And for the sixth, reason? it works really well. Okay. Just the hand works better, I think. It's just the, and also the scale, not the main scale for fourths and um, and for fourths and sixths is in the top anyway. Uh, it sense. just works. It just just works better, and I find that it's it's really good. It doesn't have to be that way, and sometimes it it's good to mix it up and not mix it up, but actually decide. Okay, today we're going to go with the bottom notes. It's fine to do that, you know. But I find scales in fourths and fifths incredibly useful for Bach. You know, I've got uh, uh, all the I've got one 
one girl has just she's just finished the um she's only in year seven she's just done the the bark fugue the g minor bark it's all in tune it's really it's outstanding but she's been really working hard on the scales and it's just like all those scales all of a sudden it's not it's not slavish it, everything is timed properly all the quadruple stops are, are worked the same way one finger at a time just introduce the other ones easy when we were chatting the other day you were talking about um some of your students only have 25 minute lessons and they're oh, able cool. yep. to accelerate through right through so you know do you want to talk a little bit about the reliance on the practice book the parents the family and how that informs the success and the progression of a student and particularly around that puberty time where things go haywire especially for Look, you know, every, every family is different it's a school program and every family you know some some parents don't care less at all and that's that doesn't matter what it, it doesn't matter what economic sort of socioeconomic place you're going to be so that doesn't um you know sort of matter what matters is that you are pretty insistent on their following what you've set up so i set up um maybe i can share screen this this is right, i'll just pop you on to um uh co-host you can I, does that am i sharing something oh uh, you can now yep does that look like it's sharing now i don't know how to do this hang on is that what do i do here to, you to... have to click on down the bottom arrow i love that queenslanders don't know how to do this oh, no. get locked down. <laughs> you did, you did. Board, is that it <laughs> you click the share screen then you're gonna have to go into it should be on your desktop have, is it open on your desktop and then you can select it oh yeah yeah, yeah. hang on um yep share oh gosh there you go that okay so for instance that that's all that's all i have for um this is just what they're doing at the moment so they'll have recordings they'll have little videos of stuff so i just pop that all up on my on um this is just for this semester this this week uh this term so i have like little recordings there um do you go week by week or do you give them the whole um terms curriculum i go week by week yeah okay. Okay. so like for instance they'll be like here this is group seven they're about grade one grade two standard on the violin and um so the, I'll, i've recorded all their scales there you see that and record their pieces um i'll give them some bow hold sort of tips and all that sort of stuff but i have a few more advanced students and i've got these two these are these are pretty incredible this is a, a violin and viola group lesson you know he's about l must standard and he's he's about a must and the viola but they they're doing a um they're, they're playing um Oh, some duets are doing a duet by the uh, the um, uh, the madrigals by Martinu. They're very nice oh. doing that sort of stuff. Yeah, so I have the whole range. You've got absolute beginners playing Twinkle Twinkle. Then I've got these people at this other end. So you know, it's, it's it keeps my wits. But I find that they if that I have everything um, outlined. They have a whole lot of booklets as well that I give them. But it's a, it's I'll stop sharing that now is that all right that's perfect but that's i share with the one note i find i used to use it at home but i find that i found that um it's actually better just to to deal with them you know with the, in their little notebooks but for school because i've got 120 in the program and and they only have 25 minutes of lesson each i find that um the, the, the one note works very well it's it's like um and you know this is like hardly a, an insight but successful teaching is not an accident you have to plan for it and just looking at your notes there you have everything so organized you don't reactively teach so you have a plan and the kids have to keep up with the plan That's right. like for our we have an immersion program for year five and um we've made 120 videos of every aspect of playing holding the bows properly all that sort of stuff you know just we do we've just done a whole lot of pencil bow holds and you know it's quite fun yep. just trying to get them to do this it's quite fun getting the beginners just to balance that 
balance of balance of the um, the bow and the thumb. That's actually quite quite useful for them. So they have a lot of fun with that. But we have a video for something like that. Have a video for unpacking the case. Have a video for setting up the the, the instrument. You know, we just so time poor in the lessons. That we just have to rely on that. And then we just say, well, how come that didn't happen this week? Didn't you watch the video? Oh, okay. So the next week it usually is fixed up. Yeah. Every uh, other teacher in the school is preparing and planning heaps of resources for all of their students. And it makes sense, of course, that the instrumental teachers do this as well. It does. And I think you, having being prepared and having all those videos and pictures and all that sort of stuff, all at your fingertips, so it's, you can just go bang. You know, or if there's if there's a problem with somebody has a, a, a problem with vibrato, then um, then I'll make a video straight away and put it on the OneNote, and that will um, make a make a huge difference. In my own private studio, I have parents coming all the time with their cameras, and they're making videos. I say, please take a picture of this, this bow hold, blah blah blah. It works really well. And and students are used to jumping online and looking at interactive resources that's how they learn these days and and how less lonely it is for them to be able to have the teacher in the room with them when they're at home that's right so i've got a funny story to share about this morning we we the boys were doing um a vivaldi opus opus three number 11 starts with two violins do you know that one at all? I think I've heard that one. I don't it's know. Like two violins, they, they really like. Anyway, so they started playing it and it was all legato. Da, 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 da. And I said, no, that, you know that's not the right style. They said, oh, but we listened to it on YouTube. I went, <laughs> <laughs> As if that's the Bible of everything. I said, you need to be selective, you know, when you're having that sort of it's stuff. It's at least TikTok. <laughs> um, oh. So navigating through all that garbage, there's so much garbage. And one thing that I really, I, I was a real thing of mine, is all these histrionics of flicking hair. And I mean, I, I'm, maybe I'm a bit jealous about that, but, but all this, all these furrowed brows. And I just think, actually, where's the music making going on here? Yeah, yeah. shut your eyes, have a listen. I do, and it I get match up, yeah. every time, you know, so, so training kids to not worry because we i had i've got a boy in one of the advanced boys who does that all the time he's just doing this and i said look you're getting in the way it's bark and it's just a cadence just you don't need to do that and it's not adding anything to it at all mm. you know? so that's a that's a big it's hard though because you've got kids at that age that are that just want to just take the world by storm you know and like you want their enthusiasm to remain really high and you don't want to crush their spirit at the time but okay. to, yeah it has to go into you just it. joke about it and i said what well, do, do you think that's do you think that's necessary what do you think you know i just uh, and i said oh maybe not i said it must feel good though doing it i said oh yes and i said well let's just just you think about that you yeah know? at another time with the hairdryer and the hairbrush <laughs> you can do that at home i've got a question for you Stephen. yeah like if you've got a student and they're starting from the beginning and they go all the way through with you, you you know what they know, you know what they don't know, you're being in charge of a really comprehensive um, thought through curriculum, okay? What happens when you inherit the, the fourth or the fifth grade student? They, they can play, but there's stuff wrong. Just sort of navigating, you know, changing of teacher, changing of technique, just to get them through to the seventh, eighth grade. Well, one thing I don't do is I don't trash the teacher. I think that's just apart from not, apart from being good manners. Um, I just think it's it's really devastating for students to just realise that you know they they think they've learned it all wrong. It's all been a waste of their time. Telling people that but they've wasted their time for the last three years is devastating you just don't go there well but, it's also it's rude because you don't know the background like this student may have succeeded in totally. spite of, yeah and i always make a point of saying well that was really that was good that was i like the way you were being taught that and you know so we just think well actually i mean i just imagine if the teacher was in the room you know how would i you know I'm going to try to support them as much as I can, you know. Um, I mean, sometimes people do come with with funny bow holds and and stuff, but 
in my experience, it's the students usually that get it wrong, you know, because we've got a bunch of really good teachers, and I know the teachers that have come, you know, that they've come from. So I just think, well, and they said, oh, I've been taught this, and I said, no, you haven't. I said, I know your teacher really well, and um, your former teacher really well. They would never do that. So I think you got it wrong. <laughs> One of the Loretta Finn gems that I've heard along the way is show me the show me your bow hold, the, the one that your teacher taught you, not the one you taught yourself. Oh, no, that's right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's a really important thing. So, um, yeah, no, I've had a lot of um, a, a lot of kids have struggled with bow holds, but I've I've um, I've been making my students do these sorts of things here. This is a tiny little tip, you know, I'm always coming up with it. This has worked quite well, where they just, um, I mean, I don't know whether people like doing this or not. We just go straight to the balance point of the bow, like that. And they usually their bows are all like this, or they, you see them trying to sort of do all this sort of stuff. I said, no, put it on the string and let's just deal with one finger at a time. So just do one finger at a time, elevate the instrument properly make sure this is all good and then i love doing this sort of thing this is the sort of thing that i really love doing is take one two three like that pinky and thumb lift off keep everything elegantly shaped and then do all this sort of stuff then play on one here like that sort of stuff. it gives a particularly the more advanced students gives a lot of control but yeah master of their tools well, that's right. So all that sort of stuff, you know, the balance, really, literally a balanced bow hold, not just look, uh, something that looks all right. It's actually functional and balance is absolutely critical, I think, for, particularly for that, that level of um, um, that intermediate level. I need to get that right. Hmm. What other like top tips have you got for um, maybe accelerating? You've got a student that really wants to be a certain level by a certain time and um what what how much practice are you expecting of them and do you talk to families about this as well is it is it well i i have this sheet here that sits on my thing all the time okay can you hold that up again because i talked can you see that hmm. now this is just a rough guide and I, I just point to them and I say, well, you want to do seventh grade you should be doing 60 minutes a day you want to do amos do you really find 90 minutes a day you know, and they say, oh, I can only find 20 minutes. I said, well, then you need to find another teacher because I, I don't do 20 minutes on Amos. So sorry about that. I wonder if anyone does 20 minutes on Amos. Is there a teacher that does 20 minutes on Amos? Crap, nobody's going to do that. So not with the amount of work that I give them. Jeez, what are they thinking? So to, to um, this is my, I have to say, I, I never used to like these and I still like, I mean, that I think Opus 45 of Volfart, number one. It's just genius. Just all of them. Just uh, if you actually go through carefully about what the what what is the point of all these, it's it's quite incredible. It's quite and actually I remember Robin saying one thing. He said, Oh, all these etude books, they all thought it all through. It was all thought out. They're all very similar. You know, when you're talking about Robin, we're talking about Robin Wilson. Robin Wilson, yeah. Oh, I had, I've had a couple of like real big tete-a-tetes with with Robin, but um, but yeah, but but actually he did a presentation in, in Oster Q and I thought, yes, he's absolutely right. There's just so much stuff that is so well sequenced in those books, and I rely on those a lot. So they do all the sixty studies for Volfart, and then we do Mazis, and then we do Kreutzer. And we start with Kreutzer number one, my favourite. They have to do Kreutzer one. They, every, every, uh, I remember avoiding it and they hated it first. Oh my God, they hate it. And I say, well, why do you hate it? And I said, well, it's hard and it doesn't seem to do much. And I said, well, that's up to you. You've got to make it work. I, I remember I, I was a student of Finton's for a while and, and that was, Kreutzer at the time and and um, it, it, I suppose it takes a while to to feel the music in that um, or, to, or to have the maturity really to appreciate the music in that and the and what is required of the student in order to in, in, in generally in the studies 
Yeah. Well, they, they're known as etudes and caprices. So that's a really, which is, where's the caprices and where are the etudes, you know? I mean, you can sort of pick some of them out, but I think some of them like number eight, you know, if you play it like a caprice, it sounds brilliant. It's, it, they all sound really good, you know? And there's deliberately not many dynamics written in there so that you can be, you can do stuff with it, you know? So, I mean, Kreutzer two is still a fabulous piece. Um, I mean, I, I took, you know, I have a whole lot of um, students at the about fourth grade level. That's where they first learn it very slowly. And then they, they don't, they, it's like a, you know, it's something that just doesn't go away. They have to, you know, do it with a, a whole range of Boeings as, as we've all done before. But um, I, I devised a fingering so that the sortier Boeing is a little bit easier. Because when you got you got you know, crossing over three strings at about a crotchet equals 152 is not that easy, you know. So having a good fingering that works really well is work. So you don't have you only have one, you know, a string change, not two string changes. Yeah. We have a question about um, double joints, double jointed hands. Oh, this is my little toolbox, by the way. I've got a whole stack of things in here. Let me see. I wrote an article for the Strad about all this. Are they closed pegs? A bit hard to closed see. Pegs. I fixed up the worst. I'm double jointed. See, look. Very gross, eh? So that strengthens that strengthened up my fingers because I remember when I was when I was doing a recital at university, this this all just locked. It locked so badly that I had to stop the violin, stop violin playing, and drag it away. It's a nightmare, in the middle of a recital. Locked. So I thought that's never going to happen again. It was just a lunchtime recital, but enough to scare me. So I thought, no, that's not going. I was so tense. I, I've been there. I've played, you know, uh, horrifically. So I know how to, when, when things come, you know, come my way, but that actually saved me a lot. And a lot of students do that. But the, part of the, the with this exercise, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to open it up too much, just let them just press it down, or even just doing this on each finger initially is good. And then they can have, I tell them to buy, they cost $2 or something like that. And you, they just keep a set in the car, keep a set in the violin case, and just do that. Be fixed, no problem. There you go, Steph. A couple of clothes pegs. Oh, pegs. So you're teaching, you're mostly teaching, well, you are teaching boys at school, but you said you largely have girls in your home studio. So you have the, the, the gender spectrum. What, what does the influence of puberty do to students as they become through those befuddled times? How do, how do you navigate befuddled times? Giving them a bit of space, I think is really important. And just trying to read them when they walk in the room, just think, mm, something's not right today. You know, the hormone levels might be out, you know, and I ask them the questions, how are you feeling? Oh, fine. And I think, okay, they're not really. <laughs> so I leave, I let them guide the lesson at that stage. I'm not so prescriptive. I say, what, 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 what do you want me to help you with? That's how I, I, I work that. And I say, oh, I'm having problems with this. It's really frustrating. Say, okay, we can probably do that. So that's what we do. Yeah. You know? that teaching 101, isn't it? Meet the child where they're at. Just seeing where they're at and and trying to just make it a open, friendly sort of thing. But I always tell them I'm 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 here for you. You know, I don't have I'm not sort of like in sitting in judgment or anything like that. You know, I, you're, I'm here for you to make you uh, in, help you enjoy playing the um, playing the instrument as best you can to be the best person you can be on your instrument. Yeah. So that's what I that's what I think. I think I find that um, 
boys can be very sultry and they can, you've got to be careful they can really hide their emotions like you would not believe and it's very hard like for them to cross that initially cross that boundary to being expressive you've got to say it's actually okay to be expressive it's okay you know if you feel that this mu music music moves you to the point that you want to cry that's okay you know, they, they, they feel that they're in a safe place. And I think that's important, you know. I was I was telling you earlier that I was uh, working with my Anam students today. So I run the community engagement um, course at Anam and, and we go out to schools and we do concerts. And one of the students, uh, the Anam students said uh, something about, oh, this slow, mo slow movement, I hope you don't find it boring. <laughs> and I pulled her up afterwards and I said, um, what do you think that says to the person that enjoys those slow movements? What have you just told them about music? It's like we want permission for everybody to enjoy everything. We leave it open for them to make up their own minds. And I think that safe space is, is really important. And sometimes we can get too busy to really acknowledge, like we might have our own agenda, but if, if the student's not ready where we are at on that day, that's a teacher problem, not a student problem. Yeah, that's and you just you can't make those assumptions, you know. There's, there's, oh, but we've played for our like our school orchestra has always played something in assembly, you know. We played fast stuff. One year I remember we did just the Albanoni Adagio. We had a really good violinist, and the boys were just it was just so so quiet because it's played so soulfully, and it just like you could cut the emotions with with a knife. It was good. Yeah. I said, oh, you really want to do this? I said, yes, I think I'll enjoy it. And it, it worked. Yeah. And, and they need to be exposed to a diverse, diverse styles, of course, which, which sort of goes to another question for you, which is when you are um, giving out repertoire to your students, is it by negotiation at some point as well? Or are you, uh, is it prescriptive? I'd sort of try to gauge what sort of person they are and what, what studies they might need. But by the time they get to the AMUS or MUS level, they choose their own stuff. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, it's good. It's good. And I say, well, why are you choosing that? You know, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I like the sound of that. And I said, okay, well, we've got to move on for why you like the sound of that. You've got to understand why the composer wrote that, you know. Like a really interesting one is the the Schumann Sonata. They all like that initially because it's just all quite a little rhapsodic and you know lots of semi quavers and and it's got a nice tune and all that. But underneath it, it actually is a, a terrifying piece. Mm -hmm. It's a terrifying piece about loss and and madness and all. I mean, Schumann wrote it when he was just just on the verge of losing his mind, and there's all. This stuff with Clara Schumann in there, it's just an awful letter, a whole letter of separation, you know. So trying to gently unpack that to students and saying this is actually a really angry and, um, and a really unhappy piece of music, it's an interesting journey, really interesting journey to sort of make them aware of all of that, you know. Yeah, you're emoting stories. And I think people connect really well to stories. So it's important that they know if there was a background to it, they should know that. This is well, what well, that's that's where I start from mostly. I say, well, what do you think's happening here? What do you, what, what do you think the composer wants to do after you've listened to this piece without even playing it? And I think that's what what are they what are you going to enhance what has already been communicated? So that's the important thing, I think. How long have you been teaching, Stephen? Are you allowed to say? Do you feel comfortable saying? Oh, geez. When my first guinea pigs were when I was about 18. Okay. So that's... Three or four years. That's uh, 45 years ago. <laughs> what, um, let's, let's say not 18, because that's still working everything out. So let's say as a young graduate teacher, so early 20s perhaps. Um, Probably when I, my first big gig was um, at Blue Mountains Grammar School. I was 20, uh, hang on, I can tell you, 25. Okay. What's, what's evolved? What are the lessons that you feel like you've, you know now that you're wishing you then with all those extra, extra years of experience and... Patience. It doesn't come naturally with me at all. I'm probably, the kids always tell me I'm the, the most impatient person. You've world. got things to do. You're a busy person. You've got restaurants to get to. 
I'm just impatient. I, I don't see why it's a problem getting from, to, you know, from third grade to seventh grade to the Brahms violin concerto. I don't see there's a problem with there. I, that's how I used to think. But there is. <laughs> there is, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you are a bit superhuman. I, I'll um, I'll tell our little our audience today what you said. Oh, I don't think I can go too late, Karen, because I get up at four o'clock on a Thursday because orchestra starts at six twenty in the morning. Six twenty, yeah. It's all right, but I, I make sure that I do an hour's practice before I start that orchestra practice, so that's fine. So for most of us. That's odd. That's an odd time to be deliberately getting up unless there's an aeroplane to catch, right? Well, I, I was up at 3.30 the other morning because I had to finish, I'm writing this new piece. So that was 3.30. I, I thought, I've got an idea. I want to just finish writing that down. So it was 3.30, then the alarm off went for 4.30. And I thought, okay, I'll go and do my exercises and then go and have breakfast and hop in the car and go do some practice and, um, and get home and then I teach till usually about eight o'clock at night. You're one of those people that always makes me feel like I don't do enough, but then oh, I kind of go <laughs> waking up at 4 a.m. You can it's have it. Completely self-inflicted and, you know, <laughs> completely. Yeah. My wife oh. complains about it all the time. Well, I'm on Anne's side, totally. Oh, gosh, she's, she's over it. She says, oh, can't you just stay still? And I said, sorry, I just can't. <laughs> I'm sure she's almost used to it. Here's another question for you then, if you've got the time, which is put oh. your examiner hat on now. And so Stephen Chin, Amy B examiner. At these higher levels, what do you, do you see any kind of recurring, I'll call them mistakes for want of a, a another word, a, a recurring problems or issues in the students that um, are coming through the system at higher levels? Well, what we've noticed is that there's just not enough foundational stuff going on. Um, there's just too many. I think people think that if they just learn four pieces and just work hard on that, that's going to work. And it just doesn't. So there has to be this, this is like a whole pyramid of stuff, you know, that has to work. So they have to be able to play their double stop scars in tune, all of them. Not just a few, but a whole stack of them, you know, because uh, everything layers on top. They have to be able to play their studies in, with a range of bowing styles. It's just basic stuff, you know. Yeah. So, and well selected studies that that's, that 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 will you know support the pieces that they're trying to play. So I I just find that's why I, I'm in favour of the repertoire exams because I can devise my own scales and studies and all that, and they get a lot more done rather than these just a few that's that's one thing I think that I think is really valuable about the repertoire exams is that they you can as a as a seasoned teacher you can construct a whole you know a whole a, a better program I think yeah you can really meet the needs of your students if you have the flexibility to create um exercises or handpick yeah. studies and, and that yeah, the, the exam should be a cross section of the stuff that they know, not the only stuff they know. Well, the, the, absolutely. And the the Amy B the first people to say that 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 that's all it is. It's just it's only a cross section. It's only a, a like it's an examination. It's not a system. So it's just so. Um, but it's so easy to just get into that sort of drawn into that. Oh, well, you're just going to get this scale right and that bowing all that, and then that just becomes your. I did that for years. That it becomes your sum total of what they do. You know, I think, well, what about all the other scales that they have to learn? You know, oh, we don't do B flat um, harmonic minor yet, and we don't do scales in one position because you don't have to do those anymore. And I think, well, no, you've got to do all of it. Stop it. <laughs> yeah, the AMEB is a syllabus. It is not a curriculum. It's a syllabus, and they're the first ones to say it's a syllabus. You know, use us if you want to. The scales, we just put them here so that you can refer to them, but it's only syllabus. This is not a scale book. This is not a technique book. This is not an etude book. It's a syllabus. And I think that, and it's very valuable for them to do the exam. I just find myself, I like the repertoire exams because I, I've got a lot more flexibility. They can do two exams quite easily and build their technique very, very, um, uh, very, very easily. Um, and, and fairly quickly and thoroughly in a year. So they get, I, I don't have a problem with kids going from, you know, fifth grade to eighth grade. And they're not really brilliant kids. They're just like 
fairly average in their in their thing but if you've got a well-constructed program and they're all loose here and everything's working properly it's not a problem awesome i want to ask you like five really quick questions and you go bang 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 and then if you are happy I can still to... hang on yeah i can still hang yeah, on if you're happy then i'll ask um any of our participants if they want to um please pick my brain questions. all right fast questions do you have a favorite piece of music oh gosh it changes all the time what what favorite piece of music do i have at the moment, oh. oh, dear, I don't know. I What's your favourite piece today? Well, my pay, I, I probably Marla Seven because I just heard that recently, and it's an old favourite of mine. So I just heard LSO play that the other day, and it was just wonderful. Incredible. Yeah. Do you have a favourite restaurant? Oh. That's a good one. Well, actually, our favourite is up here is is Agnes. Okay. We went there thirty times last last year. Sorry about that. <laughs> I think we would have seen pictures. Anyone who's befriended you on Facebook would have seen definitely seen pictures. Well, it's all wood. It's all wood fired, you know, and it's all smoked and smoky and scrap. Yeah. I mean, what's the least favourite part of the work that you do? Um. The least, oh, probably um, chasing up um, students that haven't come to their class and making sure that they're on top of what they have to be on top of. And, and also at home, which doesn't happen often, but the ones that are just not practicing. Yeah. I, I really don't like that. And I mean, I, I had a boy, I've got a boy at the moment who's, we, we started Tchaikovsky Violin and Concerto just, and this just hasn't progressed, you know, it's just, and he's got his Amos and he just doesn't, didn't want to do all his Elmas pieces. He learned the Mendelssohn and I said, well, let's play the Mendelssohn. It was terrible the other day. And I said, well, look, what's really going on at home? So I said, look, I've given you enough space to sort of try to find yourself. You, you seem to like the Tchaikovsky, but nothing's happening there. You just sort of, it's pretty tatty. So maybe I maybe you don't need to lead learning anymore. And that's the part of the job I don't like. So we've had that conversation, he's going to get back to me in a way. It's sad, because immensely talented. A, a breather is is a good solution for some students. Have a, have a breather or something like that. But I know he'll just I don't know. Hmm. All but right, well, I think they're... I know. Sorry, go on. Yeah, but part of the problem was that I don't think he was nurtured, I think properly, you know, I inherited him, but I think part part of the problem was um, that it was always important for him to be seen to be the number one person or get an A plus in the exam, like all those optics were very important. And I was trying to tell them over the last year that they're not important. What What's important is actual your appreciation and love and communication of the music that you're playing. Yeah, that's important you know your your development as an artist that's important not all this other stuff that the parents put on them and i've had to actually talk to the parents i say look you know these things are not important this a plus and getting first oh he'll cry if you know if he doesn't get the i said stop there right now if he doesn't get the first chair in the orchestra so what somebody else has got that he should be celebrating that so when people come to music for all the wrong reasons it's it there's there's nothing you can do about that you know because it's it's limited i think know? we all know that student you know we where the identity is so wrapped up in in outcome teasing that all out is just like yeah this is one job that i i sort of relish in one way if the parents are compliant but another way if they're steadfast on the optics are really important then I actually have to I have to turn around and say, look, I don't think we can work together because that's that's not important to me. Yeah. And back to your topic of intent, the intent has to be about the music. Well, the, the, like when you're playing, right, you just think you're playing, you're trying to make this beautiful phrase and then you're thinking, is Johnny B in the audience going to think that's going to be any good? That's getting in the way. There's just too many things that, that flood the mind that, that get in the way when you start thinking like that. So no wonder they feel tortured when they're playing. It must be just awful. What are they thinking? How do I look? You know, am I going to be the first? Am I going to be the best, best sounding tonight? You know, 
leave it alone. Like, and it's so hard, you know? It's so hard. Well, it's easier as you're older and, you know, you know that you appreciate people being better than you because we like to surround ourselves with people who are awesome at what they do. It's harder for young teenagers to kind of um, make those connections that it's in their best interest to not be the best all the time. Yes, and, and you, you've got to, like, it's, it's gently, gently. I wouldn't say what I'm saying to you all like that at all. I just say, well, maybe you should just look at that from an artistic point of view. Don't worry about them. Yeah. So that's how I brush it off, you know. Yeah. But deep down in me, I just think this is nuts. And if I see the parents thinking, what are you going to do? I just gently say, I said, well, look, you know, for me, that music making as an artist is the most important thing. They go, oh, yes, yes. I know they're not agreeing with me. They're just going through the motions. But... It's the application of growth mindset, though, because there is no finite end game. And it is about constantly moving the goalposts and that becomes something, it should become something that students yes. become familiar with. Yes. Which is that what's the next thing that we do? What's the next thing? There's always the next thing. There's no end game. We don't finish with a particular concerto. You've made it. You're a violinist now. Yeah. It, it, that growth mindset of being open to feedback, contributing to your own feedback, um, and, and knowing what you're aiming for in the short term, the medium term, the long term, these are goals that we can be talking about with our students to create. Create something. Well, I'll tell you, I had a really lovely thing happen, you know, on one of my years, that year seven student I talk about, she's like, she's, I think she's 12. And, um, and she's a really good player. She can sort of, you know, she can play stuff. But she just turned up and she said, look, I, I'm, I'm thinking I want to start a piano trio to explore a whole lot of um, you know, trios by Beethoven. And I went, hallelujah, thank you. This is so lovely. You know, that then I'm not having to be prescriptive or suggest anything. They just want to start their, that journey themselves, you know? So, that's really special. Congratulations. That's amazing. Well, I, think well, I just think that is good. But, but the, the parents are really lovely people. They're just, just you know, uh, restructure how... Any tips or suggestions? Sorry, I didn't get that one. Oh, I'm going to come back to those ones too for you. Yeah, sure, please. Yeah. Okay, two more really quick questions. Um, favourite part of the job? Oh, favourite part of the job. Oh, probably when I cry. For the right reasons. Mm. Yeah. When I know that students are really communicating something really mm. well, I just go, oh. I love you know, that. It happened, it happened just the other day. Some guy just played something and I thought, I, and he knew it was really good. And I said, that was just, just exquisite. Amazing. Finally. Oh, it was so tingly. It was great. Yeah. If you could offer teachers one single piece of advice about their teaching, what would it be and what would the impact be? Mm. I think from, I think keep practicing, keep practicing and don't just leave it in here, but somehow keep on top of top of things and even play some of the, you know, like even the, the easiest pieces that you think that just a second grade, there's still something to be learned from those. So, and, and set some goals for yourself, you know, why not do, you know, but I, I just got at the music the other day from, Bartok second violin concerto, which I've been really wanting to be doing. So I thought I haven't learned that one yet. So that's my little pet project. So nourish the artist in well, us. Just nourish myself. You know, I don't want to be a concert violinist. You know, that, that's long gone. But I want to be able to to demonstrate for somebody who does want to be able to do that. You know, mm. so it's it's good just to keep keep exploring new repertoire and. And the kids like, and, and you'll, you, it's good for you, them to see, I'll drag it out and say, look, I'm learning this at the moment, and this is how I practice it, you know, really slowly and all this, and they go, oh, okay. Awesome. Well, you noticed Eliana's question just before. So any tips or suggestions for how to restructure change as we teach for students who have so many activities with limited time, sports, etc. Now, this yeah, is coming yeah, from yeah. someone who has 25-minute lessons, yeah? Um, at our school where we're pretty test oriented, we, um, I'll just tell them we have a test next week on that. So it sounds really, it sounds really like banal, 
But unless you're actually vying for your place in that mix of tests and assessments, then you'll just be left way behind. And that's just the bottom line. And I didn't want to have to do that, but I'm having success with that. Now we have a we have a, a system where we have to oh can I share this screen with you? Yeah. Oh wait on. I, I don't even have to tell me because I'm gonna just find my Word document. This is what I've been doing all day today. Uh, no, hang on, that hasn't updated yet. Wait on, sorry. Hang on. Oh. Hang on, I've just, just got to find where that actually is. Come on, baby, you can do this. I don't tell me. Oh, I see why. Yeah. Okay. So I'll share this screen with you because they've got to be done tomorrow. So in the middle. Can you see that or not? Yes, we can. Okay. So this these are some of my students at school and we have a result thing that they, they have to got to make a, a grading for technique, literacy, musicality, and engagement. So we have that. So for instance, group seven, which I have tomorrow, right? I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 students. And in 25 minutes, I have to give them each an assessment. Is that crazy? Uh, crazy and important. Crazy and important, that's all we've got time for, that's all the school will allow. Um, but we get it done and you can tell by the results, some of them are okay, some of them need a kick in the pants, you know. But um, that's, and we just keep that. Now that's all uploaded onto a thing called Tableau, so that the, um, the it's actually like a graph. I'll stop sharing now. It's like a graph and they can see their progress and the parents, the parents are only interested in marks, you know? So we, all the, the, the niceties of, of shaping and all that, we, I just have to rely on the power of the lesson, you know, and what they're getting from that. And look, we've got eight string orchestras at the school and we've got two full symphony orchestras. They keep on coming back. Do you, um? How, how you said it like 620 orchestra is it two hours they get of orchestra uh nearly yeah short shy of two, like 10 minutes so ahead. really their ensemble is even more than four times their lesson in terms of how long they're spending in ensemble yes That's amazing yeah yeah it's, it's big with, i mean it didn't have to be that long but i i decided that it needed to be that long so <laughs> Let's go with, uh, we've got a question from Amanda, which is about favorite activities and exercises for helping students to really broaden their tone and stop skimming the surface. Um, I, I really like bowing at the frog a lot, making sure that, that everything is all, all done properly at the frog. It just, everything just works so much better. So we start at the frog, just maybe bay, bay, playing one hair and just making sure the arm is right. It's just so hard to do properly. And you notice that the kids don't, uh, you know, that the part of the problem of not making, using whole bows because they they just don't know how to use the lower half of the bow. So once that's all sorted out, I find that, that the arm just charges in and you can see what's going on with that. Mm. So it enables me to see really what, what the mechanics are of how all this all works. My favorite, Bow, bowing, actually the best bow changes in the world, I think. Nigel Kennedy, have you seen his bowing, bow changes? It's unbelievable. Just for its fluidity? And is that what you're looking at? It's just, you don't even see it. It's just like, you, it's just like this. And it's just, it all happens all in here. It's unbelievable. Just listen to the sound. It's incredible. Incredible. It's my bow change. <laughs> There's a lot of things that I don't like that he does, but I like that. <laughs> Have any questions for Please, Steve? I'm here. He's here. I we can. No glass of wine either. No, you're drinking wine. I'm on this um 
local it's local it's the whoops it's got the coaster stuck to it the shiraz the um four I know. I, good please questions go okay i'd like to ask a question <laughs> hello hi francis hello, love you Mwah. love you too look i just love the um the double stops the perfect intervals i've been using that a lot uh that you shared with me when i yes. started at Oster. so my question is is it okay for me to share that with other teachers sure sure but i'm going to put all of that and more in my new scale book so that's what yes, and, and when's the scale book out that's the next question. well i'm looking at next year because this year oh. i'm obsessed with the tour at the moment so <laughs> yes. so even stephen chin has a capacity even I do, but I've got it's all there. Like it, like you've got to see it to believe it. It's just yeah, ridiculous. It's just, just like but I'm that. trying to pare it down because I, I really want this scale book to be like clear and not squashed, and you know, full of different sorts of bowings, but not too prescriptive. I, I just think, just give the raw notes. I mean, there's nowhere that I, you can find a scale in fourth that is written out nicely or in all the keys or fifths. You know, like what about uh, you ask them to play G harmonic minor in fifths, right? And they need to hear all those dimension augmented intervals. You know, if if they do that, then they, you know, when they're playing all sorts of double stops, they're not just thinking it as a foreign thing. They'd be able to identify it as part of a particular scale, not like a bunch of weird notes. You know, and we've been as teachers or the with the material that I've been seeing, we've been pretty bereft in actually, you know, supplying students with all that stuff. My little, you know, eight or nine year olds don't know any better. So I trade on that. <laughs> yeah, this is what it is to play the violin with Stephen Chin and soon all of us. But I take a long time to do it. Like I don't say you got to learn this, but the, one of the big mistakes that I made as a teacher was saying, okay, well, you, you've got to learn this, this, and this by next week. So I actually see, okay, so now I shift my, my thing to, okay, show us how you're going to practice that. So they'll just break it up and all that. So I said, well, actually, in your case, you need to repeat that, that double stop about four times before you can actually feel that it's settled properly. So it's actually going to take you two weeks to learn scale of C major in thirds. Mm -hmm. So the big problem that I used to have is I used to say, okay, we're going to do C major in thirds and octaves and six, and we'll see you next week with all of that learned. Well, it's not a good idea. That creates tension because then there is um, a, an expectation of what has to be done, which may not be where the kid's child's at. And it well, also... Yes, that's right, totally. And the nitty gritty of all of that is to actually see how they're practicing. So a lot of my stuff now is, show me how you're going to practice that. Yeah. And that they learn to practice it with the understanding of what it is that they're doing. They have to understand what it is that they're learning. Yeah, well, that, that's right. You know, and they've got, if you give them enough space, they'll actually come up with the goods, you know. Mm. Amazing. So, no, it's, it's, it's good. It's, it's look at, I think it's increasingly harder with um, lots of pressure to, you know, to, to, um, to, you know, keep up with Facebook or Instagram and these kids are on it all the time. It's just, you know, you're competing against all that sort of stuff. So I, I just try to say, this is for you. You don't need a screen. This is for something that you can celebrate inside here. And once I get through to something that they can share themselves and, that's actually pretty powerful. So I really go with that a lot. Amazing. It helped me go get through the hurdle through all that stuff where, oh, well, they've got to be eighth grade or that. I think, no, let's just introduce them to the repertoire. Let's them, let them make it feel beautiful. Let them feel that they just need that part in their lives. And then we can move on from there. And it's been really good. I mean, obviously having a, an impassioned teacher is going to help to to feed that passion as well. And I think that that's something that we all observe when we're listening to you talk about your teaching and talk about your students is that it's not stale, it's not old, it's not, oh, my God, I've been doing this for 40 years. You are passionate about your students from beginner all the way through, and that's such a gift for them. Well, I'm, I'm just fascinated with people. The People are just so different. 
like they're all different and I've, and they all got all sorts of things you know some of them are vulnerable some of them has got really tough exteriors some of them are just beautiful kids you know and um and some of them are just they're very tricky you know some of them are very entitled you know it's at, at school you know they're pretty you gotta you gotta work that some of the parents are entitled but it's fun navigating through all of that and getting the best you can the best result so every because it's so different i i, I enjoy it and my teaching I mean, I have some things that we have to follow, but it does change, you know, it's not just like cardboard cutout. I think it's with most good teachers, that's what it's like. One of the things that's really changed for me with teaching is that now I'm older than lots of the parents. And that feels really different than when you're trying to inform parents who are double your age, but now I'm the old one. And it's kind of fun to, to kind of have that experience behind you as well as things conversations that once were difficult and no longer very difficult i know well, i have a girl that comes here with a grandma and I, she, she said oh my grandma's here and i always thought that she was you know but i thought actually this grandma she's she's must be 20 years younger than me so. <laughs> i'm aware we've gone so over time i i feel like we should probably do a wrap up but maybe you'll come and join us again for another another chin wag would you do yeah, that yeah, absolutely yeah it's fun can you please join me in giving Stephen a massive round of applause? This is like the Auslan round of applause because you do that really well on Zoom. Stephen, thank you for your time and your insights and your generosity in sharing these really valuable gems with us tonight. And I hope that everybody will join us for the next one, which is with Karen Chan. She's going to talk about... Oh, Karen. Oh, she's great. Yeah. And the two Karens can be up to no good. We can only be up to no good. Oh, I'll, yeah, get along for that. That'll be fun. I'm yeah. not sure when that is yet. We haven't confirmed a date, but uh, she's she's uh, she's in for next term. So let's uh, thank you so much, Stephen. I'm going to collate from Stephen some of the resources, um, some names of books and things from you, and I will send this video link uh, out to you all so that you can watch it again, um, uh, etc. Cool. cool. I might give you I might give you a copy of the um, the, the intonation thing too. All awesome. right, well, anything you want to give me, I will pass on. That so, is like yeah. um, unbelievably valuable for me. It's my thing. Thank you. That would be amazing. I'm sure that everybody would be really grateful for that too. So thank I've you. I've got so it for much. viola and cello as well, by the way. So there you go. Amazing. <laughs> amazing. Awesome. Well, look, everyone, good night. Thank you so much. Stephen, again, mwah, we love you so much. And uh, hope to yeah. see you back here next term with Karen Chan. Yeah, absolutely. Bye-bye all. Lovely to Bye. see you. Bye. Yeah. See you.